Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm not going to talk for very long because there are some really talented people up here that are going to kind of introduce what we're doing. But before that, I just wanted to say welcome back to the end of the conference. Um, we've been talking for a while about this documentary, uh, which is kind of in some ways our final keynote, and it's you all. It's your voice. Um, so we hope that you've had a great couple of days with us. I definitely have. Um, thank you first and foremost to UMW for letting us use this space. It's been fantastic. Um, and it's just been so fun to catch up with you all. So um, we're going to kick it off with this uh, final, I guess, session of the conference. And then afterwards, uh, there will be some time for some more Q&A and just discussion around what we're going to watch so Taylor yeah I'm um, I'm really excited to kind of show what we've all been working on here and and, and you know everyone who participated in the um, in the interviews um, you know I, I kind of think of like it's the times person of the year is everyone in this keynote I think um, but uh, yeah I'm excited um, and I uh, wanted to thank um, both Meredith and Pilot and uh, also specifically Noah and Amanda on the Reclaim team who also helped with some of the clipping up of stuff. And then, you know, I had to throw it in the final timeline. So um, I also want to give a warning that there probably are mistakes in here. That's just... <laughs> <laughs> And just major shout out to Amanda, who is not with us. She's in a, she's in New York right now, and she was editing from far away, virtually. So major shout out to Amanda there. So, um, but just really excited for this, and yeah, we can get started, or do we want to keep talking? Does not matter. Let's do it. I think we can get started. <laughs> nom nom nom. So you're trying to make a documentary during an event and then publish, produce it, release it at the end of the event this is a brilliant example of constraint-based design. So Antonio, welcome. Thank How you. How did you get into the open web? I don't actually remember, but you may be, well, the cause of it. So, uh, yes, the, you guys from the DTLT and uh, all that movement that sprang were very influential on my own thinking. And uh, I have to admit uh, that I copied. I mean, ruthlessly from you guys and other people too. The the MOOC from uh, uh, Siemens and and Downs. Uh, I registered for that, and that was also another mind blowing experience for me. I loved that. I loved the way the class was, the class, the course was um, being organized. I loved the websites that were done to, to center the course around. And then that, that also meant and had sense only on an open web. So I was taught how to hand code HTML in 1995 or 96. Uh, my undergraduate program was uh, one that was called professional writing. So this was, in, again, in the mid-90s, the uh, tech boom in Montreal. Uh, and um, so we were being trained for technical writing, uh, uh, copy editing, translation, all of the kind of very practical mm -hmm. writing uh, things. So it was like the... The, the, I could do an English degree, but also make my mom really happy. Uh, I was doing something practical. Um, and we had a course that we had to take uh, at the time called Desktop Publishing. Because this was when desktop publishing, like FrameMaker and PageMaker, were actually really complex. It was we were in the transition to what you see is what you get, and so the um, the instructor, who was an, uh, an adjunct professor who worked as a professional in the field, came in on the first day of class and say, "These softwares are getting easier and easier. 
um, uh, the further along they go. And so we don't need 15 weeks on FrameMaker. It's like, it's a waste of time. He's like, so I'll teach you the basics. I'll get you where you need to be. But if you really want to differentiate yourself out there as a freelancer or anything like that, you need to know how to code in HTML. And so he's like, we'll spend the first part of the course on FrameMaker and the second part of the course, I'm going to teach you how to code in HTML. Okay, right, just bunch of undergrads, we don't know, like, all right, sure, HTML. And so we did, we learned how to hand code in HTML, we found the little one by one GIF, because this was like not even CSS, so if you wanted to space things out, there's a one by one GIF, clear GIF, that was available that everyone used, like right? Yeah, 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 so that, that's how you did spacing. And so I ended up putting our student newspaper online. Um, you know, we got tilde spaces, thinking back to, to Martha talking about that at, at uh, uh, in Oklahoma. And um, and yeah, and just ended up, you know, really getting in. Our, our university also, uh, was big known really well for for engineering, and so the year that I got there, they had just uh, put in um, what was then considered high speed internet all throughout residence the residence halls, and so you we were connected to the web right at, at high speeds. There was no this was you know it was it was um, mind blowing right because you could be on the web. You didn't have to wait for dial up, and so just really started getting involved. I. You know, moved away from home, moved away from all of my friends. Um, uh, another friend of mine started a, um, what started as a Yahoo news group and a newsletter. Eventually, he turned it into a website. And so I like to say I was blogging before, before blogging was a thing. I wrote for like his online zine mm -hmm. that you can find in the Internet Archives. It's very embarrassing. How I started my career as, you know, instructional designer, instructional technologist. I used to be a high school teacher. And I started my career in the 90s in the Canadian Arctic, right up on the on the Arctic coast. And it was at a time when the internet was just coming to the Canadian Arctic. And uh, I was uh, teaching high school there and a small community school, but I was also the vice principal of the school. So I was you know, two roles going on. And uh, when the internet first came in through satellite relay, people was like, wow, we have this new resource. What? Are, how are we going to use it? Are we going to use it? And so the natural place for the community was the school. So I, I started working with technology at that time and became basically the, the resource person for the district. So for, the, for that, And I started getting more and more involved, less involved in some of the administration stuff in the school and more involved in some, how this internet was going to impact schooling. And over to over years and time, I moved around. I lived overseas in China. I did the same kind of thing in China at a, a school system there. Taught some uh, media-based courses, but also brought in uh, e-portfolio system in uh, to a school system there. And when I moved back to Canada, I thought, okay, now I'm going to formalize. I don't know what that rule is, but I'm going to formalize my career as an educator around the use of technology and in teaching and learning spaces. So that's how I. That's how the internet sort of pulled me out of the classroom, I guess, and into that role as a technologist and a designer. My entry point into the open web was essentially just wanting to make things for myself and not actually have to be bent, but do the bending um, uh, specifically for uh, hardware and software. Um, so um, a lot of my work is a combination of both and being able to customize it specifically for a vision, I think is important. And I think that the open web um, and those theologies support that. Mm -hmm. I got involved in the open web and the open movement as a student, an undergraduate student frustrated with the high cost of textbooks and looking at the world around me and having access to an unlimited in amount of information on the web instantly at no cost. And yet there was the cognitive dissonance of being charged expensive textbooks that you know were old, out of date, print, and trying to reconcile how those two things existed in the same world. And this was the early 2000s. And since then, I've worked with students across the country to advocate for more affordable textbooks, for open educational resources. I now work a lot in policy, advancing 
open policies and funding for open educational resources on college campuses? Oh gosh, I don't even remember now. I mean, early days, 1993, 94, um, I was in grad school and I was freelancing doing um, some QA and copy editing for Penguin Electronic, um, working on some of their CD-ROM book editions. And my boss um, at the time, Julie Hansen, who is now the COO of Babbel, um, the online language learning. Anyway, um, she came into work one day and sort of handed me some HTML something. I, I can't even remember. It was like a sheaf of paper telling me a little bit about how, how HTML worked. And she said, um, I need you to build this a website. And I said, you, you need me to do what? And um, she said, look, here's, here's the thing. I'm going to show you. It's really cool. And so she loaded up a web page, and she did view source. And she showed me what HTML looked like live. And she's like, this makes that, and make us a website. And I did. And it was the most revelatory moment, um, just realizing that this web thing um, could actually be, like, manipulated and controlled, and I could make web pages. Um, and it didn't take, um, it didn't take like fancy equipment and it didn't take a fast connection. And it, it just took a text editor and me poking around, finding out what I could find out about how to make these web pages. So it started then. And, you know, um, as you heard this morning, um, you know, I was an early adopter ever since, right? Picked up blogging relatively early, um, picked up other kinds of things and just um, loved that sense of being able to make something new. Um, I first encountered the open web through um, two pathways, uh, I would say. The first was the CUNY Academic Commons. I had been looking to do some course blogging with my students, and the Commons just kind of popped up. Um, and I was able to, you know, interact with a bunch of great people, and it led to me being part of the early uh, version of the uh, team that worked on the Commons, and I did some outreach at the time. But the other one was I found DS106, and particularly I found DS106 Radio first, um, and was engaging with a lot of people via Twitter and DS106 Radio, and then I think the summer of Oblivion was probably the one of the funniest experiences and enjoyable experiences been interacting people and making art with them and building an online narrative, right? Uh, this story um, was tremendous fun. And I think, I don't remember what year, that was like probably 2012, I think, I don't know. I guess I remember vividly the first time I saw a web page. A friend of mine who was a librarian showed me a web page that was an X-Files fan page. Um, so this would have been 1995 maybe. And, uh, and then I started looking into it, and I, it just grew in my head. I was like, how does this, oh, I see, ah, I see. And uh, I got very excited, and uh, I'd already been teaching with technology at that point, um, using technology to sound primitive now. Uh, actually teaching one class, teaching my students Unix file permissions so they could trade files back and forth. Um, and then I, you know, I taught myself HTML and making web pages, and I've just been going great guns ever since. In fact, in uh, 1997, I landed my first faculty job in part because I had experience with the web. Even though it wasn't part of my formal job description, um, in part because there were just hundreds of PhDs in literature running around uh, for any given job. But actually, experience with the web was relatively small at the time. I came from a family of early adopters. My dad was very uh, fascinated with, uh, this is in the 80s, he um, was always buying the newest and best gadgets. And uh, my older brother, who's about seven years older than me, he built his own machine and he was very into coding. And uh, so it was like, Computers were a lot around uh, when I was young. And then when Brian and I got married in 1993, uh, we had a small inheritance from my, from my grandmother. And it was enough to either buy a really good computer or a really bad car. 
and we chose the really good computer. And one of the things the really good computer had was a really good modem. So we were able to log into uh, the university, um, you know, uh, bulletin board servers and that kind of thing. Um, you know, so there was all the, all of the uh, bulletin boards and then the CompuServe, AOL, all of that um, started becoming, you know, a thing. So... In 1995, I was uh, pregnant with my daughter, and this is the reason I remember it. The first time I'd ever heard the, the phrase World Wide Web was in 1995 while I was pregnant, and we were sitting around talking about the, the newest, coolest stuff. And uh, so it wasn't too long later that... Um, uh, my work started being like, well, everybody needs an email address and uh, everybody needs this and that. And then they wanted me to do some HTML work because I was the only one who, I was the youngest person in the office and I was the only one who had ever used email. I had to check my boss's email is basically what I had to do. And um, so, yeah, I mean, since then... Um, I haven't done any Christmas shopping in person since 1997 because I loathe and despise Christmas shopping and toys.com was a thing in 1997. I was a graduate student at uh, UC Berkeley. It was my last year of graduate school. And there was a workshop on using Netscape Composer to build web pages. It was the fall of 1998. And I went to that workshop and it changed my life. I think I stayed up that whole weekend just putting my dissertation online, um, uh, uh, bibliographies, everything that I could think of to share that could be useful to someone in the world. And that's still how I see the open web. I, I, I put all my work online and the content development I do all happens through blogs and blogging. I'm still blogging. Um, and I think I first got into the open web in the late 90s. Uh, I had just gotten a teaching job in Mexico, and um, it was actually my first time having ready access to what was then passing for high-speed internet. And I was a new teacher. I had never taught before. I was in a new country. So I quickly realized that the internet was an incredible source of um, lesson plans and, and teachers sharing their experiences and their ideas in the classroom in different places. Mm -hmm. So that was an incredible resource. And a lot of my students were doing websites and things like that. So I quickly learned that it was a fun assignment. And I was living in a relatively isolated part of Mexico, at least to other major urban centers and to my home and all these other places. But there was this beginning of this thing where you could connect your students with uh, people around the world and set them up. And it was all free and it was easy. So you know, just the ability to... Um, to, to, to get access to that information for free and to connect to things and gather them and then have my students connecting with people was something I saw, you know, really early on. Um, <laughs> two comp sci students that I lived with when I was in my undergraduate at university. I think we were the first year that got email um, and they introduced me to mudrooms and talkers and so pre- a Netscape Navigator was the browser, and but that was a way of connecting to people beyond my university and, you know, into a kind of other world. Uh, all like green screen text, very old school stuff. I think I went to a nightly conference in Valparaiso. No, it was, um, where was it? Somewhere in Indiana, this guy named Brian Alexander came out and he introduced Twitter to attendees. So nightly was the National Institute of Technology and Mobile Education. It was kind of a spin-off to get you know small liberal arts colleges started with you know understanding educational technology and you know bringing it to teaching and learning and research on campuses. So this this like dude named Brian Alexander, who was nobody to me at the time, just a big fluffy beard, is on the stage and says, "Hey, look at this! Watch this!" So I said, "Okay, I got to create a Twitter account." And you know, of course, I'd already known about the internet. I was building websites for ten years prior, um, but I got on Twitter, and then I guess just through whatever. 
you know, I started seeing these tweets by, you know, the people who eventually that I came to know, like Alan Levine and Jenny Room, uh, Al Kuros, who else was on there? Um, uh, what's his name? George Seaman. So, so just a, you know, a bunch of Canadians, but I was also following people in France because I, I was in France there for five years. And so eventually it just kind of came down to this like DS106 hashtag. And I realized that that was a really neat community that was coming out. And then at the same time, I mean, Wikipedia was really taking off. I mean, they had to like band it at Middlebury. It's like, whoa, like this is some like, you know, alchemist handbook, you know, people are going to get burned at the stake. So I started, you know, clicking on links and the links just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, search engines were coming out. I got onto Flickr. I was taking lots of pictures. And so all of a sudden I realized there was this whole, and this thing like PL, personal learning environment, personal learning networks, those, those words were coming out. And I realized that, you know, I was like, like these different nodes were being start, you know, like this whole web is being spun up, this personal web, or as Gardner would call it the personal cyber infrastructure, right? And, and it was really fascinating, you know, so I could find, and it was really exciting. There was a lot of energy and people started creating stuff and, you know, like make art. It was really fun. That's kind of where I came into the open web. My experience of the web that was, as a woman on the web, <laughs> wasn't pleasant. Even in those early mudrooms, there was sexual harassment, there was stalking. It was kind of, it's always been a little bit creepy. So, um, I, I think that stuff may not be better, but there's more awareness of it now. So there's maybe not much I miss about the web that was, because it wasn't always a super comfortable place to be. What has grown since then is, would be projects like, um, say like Wikipedia, mm. where you've had time for sort of a cumulative process of, of building wisdom through uh, the contributions of many, many community members. So you've got resources built up now that are very, um, I mean, not, not that everything's been exhaustively documented or, or more or explained by any means, but you, but there's the, um, you know, the, the, the amount of, of good, um, information and content is just, it's, it's, it's staggering. Um, you know, I, I know in a sense that uh, from a, from a purist point of view, maybe, um, we might want to idealize or even romanticize the early web prior to the big platforms, you know, prior, prior to social media. Um, but again, I mean, there's always trade-offs, you know, like being, you know, being able to learn things from watching a series of YouTube videos. I know with some of our work, like with the Open Pedagogy Notebook, there are spaces where educators are sharing their practices, connecting with each other, building on each other's ideas in ways that is happening much faster and can be amplified much more much further. Um, you know, I think about projects like the Open Educational Resources University TAS that really is kind of leading the way with a robust suite of open ed tech that doesn't have people compromise the ethics of what they're trying to do in order to attain some sort of more efficient goal. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot, but um, I, I have great hopes based on, on, on the trajectory of where things are going. But I think connection, amplification, uh, and being able to kind of break outside of where we're working individually is, is a hu huge part of that. Uh, a, a particular story was with one of my courses and uh, Hurricane Maria in 2017, because the hurricane and the situation that happened after the hurricane in Puerto Rico was so dire and so devastating that um, uh, together with Alan Levine, we decided to open up um, a podcast. And it was, I mean, a really fun podcast because we had almost no uh, fixed uh, schedule or frequency. So we did... Uh, um, 
an episode and then uh, uh, more than a week passed without us noticing and etc. But it was very much fun. And I remember recording the first uh, episodes of that podcast uh, in the, 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 the real aftermath of the hurricane. So when my university was still without any form of electrical power and uh, or perhaps it, was, it had a couple of generators so it was a very nice um, thing. And then Alan had this great idea of breaching the, the web with the atomic world. And uh, he began spreading the idea that people sent me and my students postcards from all over the world. And so we were soon um, showered by, by the postcards that we received. I still remember one from a great woman, Parisa, an Iranian woman living in Japan uh, and teaching English in Japan <laughs> was amazing. That story was really amazing. And she sent me an avalanche of little bookmarks done by her students in terms of um, encouragement for us to, to keep on. And so that was such a beautiful story that I, I do remember. And, and that story wouldn't have happened in a, in a constrained world. There are many, many more voices online. The barrier to, to entry, the barrier to participation and the ability to build community and claim our, our presence is is quite different now. Still not unproblematic. <laughs> um, still doesn't mean people aren't a target. Um, maybe more so now, um, but in you know in our current political climate. Um, but certainly, you know, the kinds of people who were online when I first got online, it was a narrow demographic. It was people who had access to computing technology. It was people who were, had a level of technical sophistication, and that's not the case so much anymore. I think it was Safia Noble that said that algorithmic bias and in artificial intelligence is a human rights issue in the 21st century. And I think that is something that our community really needs to focus in on, is just the human impact of all of this technology that we're using, how it's becoming infused in, in you know, essential tools for a 21st century lifestyle like Google, and the violence that the uh, decisions that people who code those programs make and, and inflict on people who are, you know, marginalized and, and affected by that. So I think, you know, it, it, no matter where you are in, in the community, no matter what you're advocating for, making sure that we understand the implications of, of our work and, and really put at the center of it building a web and tools that's going to be equitable to everybody and to the extent we can, um, make sure that that we're using our, our human intelligence to minimize, you know, bias and harm. All the different kinds of accessibility now, um, like especially something like um, uh, good uh, auto captions uh, uh, for video, uh, good OCR to get text out of images, um, good translate services so that people don't have to be putting stuff online in a commonly spoken language. You know, they can put stuff online in their language with hopes that all kinds of people around the world would be able to access it. Um, so not just accessibility in that sort of legalistic sense of, of what you're supposed to do as a teacher, but accessibility in the biggest, broadest sense of, of that total sharing that can happen online and that needs to happen across languages, across modalities of, of how you access information online, visual, oral, whatever. The great work that software developers for WordPress and, and others, the developer communities out there, they're making it easier for non-technical people to accomplish goals they couldn't have done in the past. You know, um, you know, just being able to build a really beautiful site that can tell a story with multimedia has gotten a lot easier, and you couldn't do that before. You know, there was a lot of tinkering and a lot of, you know, the more technical, the geeks had to figure that stuff out. So I like the fact that, you know, pretty much you know, content that I create on my mobile device is, is pretty, pretty good, you know, audio, video, et cetera. So that, that's something that um, I think is a great accomplishment. The web has gotten very good at making our lives easy. And over time, 
that's one of the things that I've just continued to notice as the web has evolved, that everything just gets so easy to find what you, you're looking for, to connect with people, the, the programs become more intuitive, how to navigate menus, how to find settings. It's just all become so much easier. And I think that's come at a cost though, because it's, I guess, the forces that are driving those tools that have become so easy to use are designing them, not necessarily to make our lives easier, but to extract our data and build a business around that. Something that the past web did not have that I think the present web has is um, ease of use, right? Um, you know, it was always really difficult to understand how to do things. And um, you had to really search those sources out, whether that be educational, like going to college for something, um, joining trade groups, joining, joining homebrew clubs, those types of things. Um, now, you know, you're, you're a good 10 to 20 YouTube videos of way from mastering something. And um, I think there's a lot of power in that. I think that there is um, a lot of power that is actually given back um, to the consumers of content. Um, and from a positive, positivist perspective, um, I think that's one of the best things about the web is being able to educate yourself to make really amazing, cool things. So I think the thing that inspires me about the web and where we're going forward is more around there's enough tools and community around building the web that I can now point to things that other people have made in my classroom and I can just tell my students we're going to build that. And 10 years ago, the tool sets surrounding the web were not well defined, the communities weren't there, but you can actually start, it's transferable to give someone else the shoulders to stand on of giants. It used to just be, hey, there's a browser, sweet. Hey, we can search for things on the web, sweet. But now it's actually, here's the tools used to build those things. And you can click a button or you can run a single command in a terminal prompt and you have that capability. And we've got enough documentation. You've got a lot of automation with tools like ChatGPT that I can then ask, like, how the hell do I use this? And you end up getting a decent enough response that you can get started. My classroom teaching from three years ago is completely transformed because of the standardization and stabilization of those lower levels. I still keep looking for the same stuff I've been excited about since I first started doing stuff on the internet. I just get so excited when I see people working, whether with students or people in the community, where the affordances of online technology help people find a voice to articulate things, to gather knowledge, to learn, and then share back something that maybe benefits somebody else somewhere else. And that basic dynamic of seeing people share their learning or sharing their passion online in a unique idiosyncratic voice or a collective voice uh, that they're part of uh, is super exciting to me. And I, I still, anytime I see a, a project that empowers students or community members to, to do cool stuff and share it, I get excited. Well, I, I think for me, it's just fascinating because of the engineering that keeps taking place. I mean, I think about it in terms of, um, you know, the way the trajectory that Silicon Valley is on right now will likely have, you know, AI generated essays submitted by students that are evaluated by AI driven grading platforms for faculty, which is terribly efficient, but there's zero education happening in there. So, so for me, I, I'm, you know, nostalgic about the elements of learning that are intensely human, that sense of connection and, and belonging. And I and think part of that is, you know, what can happen in a classroom, even without any technology, that that allows education to live up to its potential to, to have the student to have students feel like they belong, to be able to flourish, and for educators to, to really personalize their learning. That's not driven by an algorithm, but that is driven by their humanity. I like how messy it was and how it would almost demand that you have to be crafty and creative. And as time went on, 
uh, and I think that was mentioned today in like Kathleen's talks, things became more polished, things became much more, uh, you know, um, templated, I guess, you know, and like the template itself, like the earlier web sites were a little messy, but they were all unique, like yeah, no one looked the same. And as time went on, things started to look, there's a lot of sameness, right? It, it, ease of use, but with ease of use comes restrictions on creativity and restrictions on the types of expressions that you see in online spaces. So I do miss that. There is a movement, um, if you've ever looked at Yesterweb, um, that's more like the old school uh, blog chains where, um, and I'm looking for that sort of coming back and also again with the discords with creating our own communities but they're not such walled silos because this is one of the things I hate about like Facebook because of the way the algorithms work it will hide things from you that might be really good to know um, whereas you know, the yester web is more like um, old school web surfing, where it's like, oh, that's an interesting topic. I'll, I'll, I'll click on that and read that for a long time. And I'm hoping we're going to see more of that. And definitely the DIY aesthetic. Um, you know, many of the uh, sites have gotten, like YouTube used to be delightful in that it was everybody was an amateur and nobody knew what they were doing and i'm waiting for that new thing because everybody on youtube is terribly polished and and they all have like wonderful production values blah 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 and i'm really looking for that you know sort of old school scrappy garage i whipped this together in my mom's basement type stuff mm -hmm. The work that I see in tech right now that I'm hoping will evolve um, is more backlash to um, some of these larger conglomerates that we are currently addicted to. Um, a great case, and I'm sure other folks have mentioned it, but um, it's Mastodon versus Twitter. Um, this idea that decentralization isn't just something that Tim Berners-Lee thought of 40 years ago. This is something that needs to push back on the services and the forces and the control that we currently have. Um, and I think we're starting to see that. Now, with that said, we need to find ways to protect those, uh, those new entities that uh, decentralize, anonymize, and um, really aren't a capitalist endeavor, they're a social endeavor. You know, what I want to see in the future is a, a return to the values of the open web, um, of, of a growing inclusivity and a growing sense of access and a growing emphasis on, on real sociality in um, the ways that we connect with one another across the web. Um, Will we see that? I mean, I think I think we're we're at another fork in the road. We're we're at a place where it's a real possibility. Um, and so I, I think it's going to take it's going to take a kind of conviction and it's going to take um, a lot of collaboration and mutual support. and um, I mean, what else would I say? I think it's going to take a lot of determination to get us there. Um, but I'm really, really hoping that the future of the web, brings together a lot of what we know now that we didn't know in 2003, um, but also with that innovative spirit of 2003 that can lead us in some new directions. Um, I think one possibility is that we will maintain our the indie web idea and carry that forward, and that will become a kind of cultural artifact um, that may or may not be economically viable, um, but is maintained by love. Um, I think it's possible that we will either see a, uh, a web that is aimed at climate change to have as small a footprint as possible, which means a retro web, a smaller web, or we may see a web that is actually designed to help us be more resilient. Uh, I was just this morning, um, taking my wife showed me this news about the Canadian uh, terrible, terrible fires in Nova Scotia and Quebec, and how the smoke from that has been drifting down the eastern seaboard. So actually, I went looking on, on the web to find some information about this. There's a great uh, uh, air quality site maintained by the U.S. government 
pull that down. So more of that site, um, and I think is the kind of thing that we may see more of. They may be maintained by crowd supporting and crowdsourcing as well. Um, uh, another possibility is that the web shrinks drastically. And it could shrink because of physical damages, such as by uh, solar storms uh, or by human storms. Uh, it could be cut back by our failure to grapple with climate change. Uh, it could also be just regulated out of existence, either through formal regulation or through people's attitudes. Um, we, we talked last night in one keynote about the idea of rewilding the web. And one possibility is that we wild it through abandonment. Um, and we have lots of abandoned websites. So those are some, those are possibilities. I don't like that possibility. But as a futurist, I, it's, I'm, I have to show people the wide range of possibilities. Where is the web going? I, I don't know. And I want to say that's an optimistic thing. Like, I don't think there's any kind of inevitabilism about, say, you know, Facebook taking over the internet. You know, they, they certainly have ambitions in that regard, but it's an open question. Um, I'm not going to make predictions. I just know I'm going to make my opinions known um, as I see things happening. And, and also just to, you know, we vote with our digital feet about where we go, where we spend our time, where we devote our efforts. And that's why I'm so glad for this conference, because I meet people who are doing really fantastic work that I want to support and I want to spread the word. And this is a place to find out about it. Well, I probably take a more Aaron Schwartz, Schwartzian view that everything should just be out there. We have these standards. They're great for communication, transport. These protocols exist. Why are we locking them back down or assuming that the big four are in control of our destiny? We all have access to them. Maybe blogging will be back, but certainly the creativity is not going to go away. I think that that's, that's the important part is that, that people will continue to create things. I think Federation will add some back of the human back into some of these, you know, web platforms and, you know, teaching, learning, and living on the web. I mean, I'm seeing glimmers of the quote-unquote band getting back together again. Like, it's really nice to be here in particular and engage people I haven't engaged in a while. Um, and just finding ways to interact and, and, and build things together. I've been lucky to build a couple things, like, for you guys, you know, um, and that was, that was like a glimmer of, you know, hope for me and like, and to see it used by so many people and really it, it work um, in, a, in, a, in a satisfying way for those people that were using the, the conference site. And so if that's a starting point, I just hope more things like that, you know, you know, see people get back and start making things together again. And, you know, DS106 for life, right? I still... I'm just still amazed at the idea of the, the, the idea of the web. Yeah. You know, going back again, I, I, I get inspired just thinking about. You know, uh, Jim just mentioned the Dave Weinberger's um, uh, idea: small pieces loosely joined, and just kind of that. Um, um, you know that, that that we have this system where you can you can discover so many things. And just learning how to, um, like I said, how to how to how to understand and parse a URL, and, and explaining that to students, and, and saying this is this is what this all means. And if you understand a little bit of this, um, it can you know you can it can be so helpful for you in, in connecting to other people and to ideas and. and uh, um, so I'm not a very good um, prognosticator in terms of you know what the, what is the web going to become. Um, I don't know. I um, I mean I hope it, it, there, there will still be places where where people can make of it what uh, what they want to. Yeah. Congratulations, Taylor. It is now time for the Q&A portion. Um, I think we'll just sort of 
take turns running mics out and then answering questions and things like that. But we did it. <laughs> we should, I should say too, I mean, uh, the Q&A here, I guess, I don't know, We the three of us didn't talk about this, um, but I'm kind of hoping, what'd you say? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, but I'm kind of hoping, I'm thinking of this as a Q&A at stuff you just watched, right? So feel I, feel free to direct questions or pose questions, I guess. Not everyone's here who was in the video. Some folks had to leave early. But at the room is kind of what I'm thinking. Um, but yeah. If anyone have thoughts or stuff, we'll run mics out to you. So. It's on a quick thought, which is that if you guys are going to do a, you know, a, a transcript to go with this, it would be so cool to get a word cloud out of it because there were words and themes that just came up over and over again. And I think it would be really beautiful to see that visualized just like in, in one shot of all the ways that connect, share, discover um, came up. So. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think, too, the, a lot of the conversations that we had outside of what we just saw like in through throughout the whole interview like i i just asked the questions pilot was next to me typing away on all the transcripts of like what everybody was saying so i think even just taking like a word cloud from from your notes pilot like that would be so cool uh, I may have an AI tool that can take a transcript. Yeah. Yeah. That is going Whisper. to Whisper, we can do that. That is going to be objectively higher quality than doing a word cloud out of my notes, but I appreciate the thought. Questions or notes? Or this isn't so much a question. <laughs> or changes you want us to make? I, I already noted some mistakes. I'm missing some titles in there. How hard was it to do? Like, you know, it'd be interesting. I'm sure people know, like, this was all taken over the last day. Some of it this morning, right? Over the last day and a half, two days. What was your process? Like, how did you all figure out how to do? Because I kind of said, I want to do a documentary, right? Figure it out. So, like, what did you all do? <laughs> what is it you do here? Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, Meredith kind of kept, a little bit right yeah yeah so we kind of just as we were planning the rundown of how we were gonna like even just all of reclaim like kind of put this on like for the last couple of days we just it just ended up that the three of us were kind of more the documentary folks and um pilot was really instrumental in like setting up the the shot every time just to make sure that like the person was sitting in the right spot the camera was pointed the right way they were looking in the right direction um i just asked questions <laughs> Like everybody came up with the questions. I kind of introduced everything to continue the conversation and facilitate to make it seem more like a conversation than like I'm, I'm literally sitting at sitting and talking to you about questions. So it was really cool. Yeah. And we did have uh, Jim asked some questions for from folks and Lauren did as well. And I don't know that I'm missing anybody, but yeah. Meredith did the mm -hmm. majority of them. And it is kind of interesting from my perspective as the editor, it was, uh, easier to edit the ones where we had fallen into a rhythm a little bit um, because it was easier for me to go like, oh, I'm looking for something like this. It's probably the third question asked, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I have two specific things that I wanted to say, which is um, to what you were saying, Meredith, about just asking questions. I could as easily say, oh, I was just taking notes. And Taylor, I, I don't think you would downplay your role, but I know that a time or two you've said that your job was made substantially easier by um, Amanda and Noah trimming clips, by my notes, and the idea of that you were just pulling it all into the timeline, which is simply not true. Um, and I think that it's very easy for us as a team to say, oh, I was I was just doing this. Other people did the real work. Um, uh, our last interviews finished two hours before we were set to start talking here. Uh, so this was an amazing team effort, um, and I don't want anyone to sell themselves short. The other thing is that in terms of team effort and people contributing, at the start, uh, last week, basically, we put out a call in Discord that said, if anyone wants to be interviewed for the documentary, we'd love to have you. Please share your stories. And we got two signups 
And we are very, very thankful uh, to Lee and to Brian Ollendike for signing up ahead of time. But we were so scared <laughs> on Monday morning that that was going to be it. And it would have been a great documentary, but it would have been about 40 minutes back to back of Lee and Brian. Um, <laughs> I think everyone, but... The director's cut. The director's cut. Um, but uh, th the reclaimed hosting version throughout um, Monday and then throughout Tuesday and even this morning we had people saying, you know what, actually I do want to be part of this to the point where on Monday and last week we were saying, all right, we'll have half hour interview sessions and then we'll talk to everybody for a half hour. By midday yesterday, we had to cut them down to 15 minutes. Um, I was nervous about whether we'd be able to get everybody in. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to everybody who signed up to be interviewed because that was great. And it, it felt very scary Monday morning. Yeah, and a couple couple other notes it mentioned before, but Amanda and Noah cut up clips separately. So we kind of round tripped some of these through Google Drive. And, but uh, we did find uh, that takes a lot of uploading and downloading. <laughs> I mean, we knew that, but um, but that was really helpful for me. And then um, Pilot is a known prolific note taker in the Reclaim, in, internally at Reclaim. And so that was great too. So I could look at these like surprisingly complete notes and, with timestamps. So I could go, yeah, that sounds cool. Zoom to that time code and the clip and find it, so. Other questions? Uh, this isn't so much a question as it is a comment. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that it was, uh, as, as someone kind of new to the space, w one thing you notice as, I don't know if it's, yeah, just being new to the space, there are a lot of connections that have already been made by folks here and that, you know, if everyone's happy to see each other. And so it was really nice to see some of the people on the screen and them talk about their experiences and then kind of get a little bit of the history. So I know and it's not lost on anyone here, I'm sure that this is going to be like a really great artifact about the folks who are in the spaces and stuff. So I, I appreciated seeing that. Thanks so much. And I think that was uh, part of the core idea. Uh, Jim mentioned earlier that he uh, said he wanted a documentary and told us to figure it out. Uh, with the idea of we were all really excited to have all of you here and to preserve this moment um, and the conversations that came out of it and what you were thinking. One of the interview questions that we asked that mostly didn't make it in and it probably might if we do a director's cut was, what did you think of the event? What are you feeling? What are the conversations here sparked? And that was really nice to, th the answers that we got were really great there. Yeah, and I just want to like riff off of that too, like with, with Jim's creative restraint of like documentary, do it um, sort of sort of attitude was really fun because um, that's kind of where the best stuff comes from is those creative restraints. And it's really cool to see everybody's perspective because we have a wide range of ages here from like my first interaction was 2013, literally in Jim's freshman seminar class at Mary Washington. That's like kind of one of my core memories of the internet and then hearing stories from 1995, 1993, like all sorts of like like years ranging throughout the whole thing is really cool too. So like that that to me was like really, really helpful and good perspective for, for everything. Um, I just, I wanted to first just commend you guys because that was incredible. And um, just as a comment about what people were saying in general. I, re I particularly really enjoyed the section on the web that was in hearing so such variety of origin stories um, from everybody in this room. All of, you know, all of us kind of share a lot in terms of, uh, I think our vision and our experiences, but the stories of how we came to this place, um, there's just, there's a lot of really rich variety there, which I think was important to right? that there isn't a single path that's gotten us where we are. 